Uh, let's begin. Um, so quick plan of the day. We've been doing this for a few months now, so hopefully people are starting to get familiar with the new format that we're using. Um, we're aiming to be quite interactive here. So please yeah, speak up, participate, um, type things in. Probably the, the NERSC user Slack webinars channel is a uh, easier and, and more you know, long lasting place to put uh, chat, but yeah, also in the, in the Zoom chat if you wish. And our agenda is so we'll, we'll go through win of the month, um, and today I learned, so these are opportunities to you know, talk about things that have happened in the last month and you know, celebrate our successes and learn from our challenges. Um, we have a few announcements and also open the floor for announcements that um, any of our users here would like to make. Um, this is a, a good opportunity for like uh, your course for participation and so on. Uh, a particular thing we're going to talk about a little bit there is uh, preparation for the AY uh, allocation year transition, which is coming up in January. Uh, then our topic of the day is HPSS, NERSC's archival system. And uh, Nick from NERSC's storage team is here and he's going to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, HPSS and you know some of its uh, I guess uh, tips and topics and history, and we'll talk a little bit also about uh, using it. And then we'll finish up with sort of uh, last month's numbers and, and what's coming up. So first thing is win of the month. So the intent of this segment is um, you know, to show off an achievement or to shout out somebody else's achievement that you know about. So for instance, if you've had a paper accepted, uh, solved a bug that you know, was uh, you know, proving a challenge for a little while, um, you know, scientific achievements are, are really good. These are also kind of you know, opportunities to you know, make yourself and your, your work known um, for you know, potential nomination for you know, science highlights or um, high impact scientific achievement awards uh, or for innovative use of high performance computing awards. So these are awards that nurse uh, uh, awards to users each year. Uh, does anybody have anything that they'd like to kick off with? Something interesting that's happened in the last month or so? Lots of silence. Nobody's uh, nobody's done anything, <laughs> or it's just been a, a challenging month. See, so I have some uh, yeah, quite encouraging news. It's also kind of a, a yeah, a, a bit of a thank you to users who have um, answered so far. Uh, we have our annual NERSC survey is currently open, and. You know, surveys are there are a lot of them nowadays, and you know it's, it's quite a challenge getting a, a good response rate. Um, but it's quite important to us to get you know our users' feedback on what's going on. And uh, I was looking at the numbers that we've had, uh, the, the responses that we've had coming in just the other day, and yeah, you know, so far we've had a, a really good participation rate. So um, that's, that's really encouraging. And yeah, you know, thank you users who have. Um, Participated, and if you haven't, there's still time. Um, you know, please uh, send in your feedback. There is a, a link in your emails. Does anybody else have uh, something they'd like to talk about? Oh, we can go on to the, the flip side of this same coin, uh, which is today I learned. So in the you know, win of the month, we're talking about achievements. In today I learned, well, there's also a degree of achievements here, just achievements that might have uh, 
you might have come in a slightly more painful way. And the idea here is to you know, recognize that things don't necessarily come easily. And you know, there's, there's plenty that we can learn from challenges. Um, and you know, it's helpful to each other uh, and other users to, you know, to know about the things that we tripped up on. And you know, even if we didn't solve them yet, uh, challenges and um, ideas that you know, others might be able to help us through. And uh, you know, this might also lead to you know, improvements that we can make to our documentation or ideas for further training. Um, it's also a good time to talk about just you know, something new and interesting that you learned, an interesting seminar that you saw, for instance. Anybody have any um, tips that they'd like to tell us about? Or oh, things that they're stuck on that they'd like to bounce off the, the room? So I and I suspect others at NERSC have been learning in the last couple of weeks about the degree of complexity of all the different systems that make up NERSC. So we've been planning for this uh, power maintenance that's currently going on. And it's, it's quite a complex sequence of operations, all the different uh, systems and services that use just some element of infrastructure that's in the NERSC building. Since for this maintenance, we need to actually turn off all power to the building. It's, it's kind of a, a step beyond even uh, what we've had to do in the past for uh, public safety power shutoffs in the, in the PSPS, you know, we can usually keep something going on a, on a backup generator, but because this time it's the actual power infrastructure that's being upgraded, uh, everything needs to be, you know, carefully shut down and brought back. Yeah, no other uh, new tips or tricks. Uh, we will have a few of them coming up actually in our topic of the day. Oops. Oops. Uh, all right, we'll move on then to announcements and calls for participation. So we have, uh, oh, as always, please, uh, Check the weekly email, there are new news there. Um, I mentioned before, NERSC user survey is currently open, thanks to those who have responded. And if not, please do. Uh, and as I think everybody is quite aware, we currently have a power maintenance, which means that uh, all systems and services are available this week. Um, and that even includes actually the help system. So one of the services that's unavailable is our uh, uh, authentication service, which prevents logging in to uh, help.nurse.gov. Just a tip on that, that you might've noticed that the help.nurse.gov site uh, before the maintenance has changed. We have a new service portal, which you know, we think is a easier interface and a, and a clearer interface for, uh, you know, for asking questions and for identifying, you know, help, helping to categorize the questions. So I think I saw Richard on, and I know he had an announcement to make. Would you like to take the floor, Richard? It looks like Richard left. Oh, he's dropped out. He uh, may come back in a, in a little bit. 
Um, so before we go on to, we have uh, some kind of fairly well-defined announcements around the allocation year transition. Um, does anybody else have any uh, CFPs or things that uh, they'd like users to know about or nurse to know about? Okay, if not, um, so I think probably the, the biggest announcement coming up that we have is that the allocation year transition uh, will be coming up before the next NUG meeting, before the next NUG meeting. Uh, yes, it will actually, it will be the day before. Um, so Tuesday, January 19 is when the current allocation year will finish. Uh, we'll have our monthly scheduled maintenance on the Wednesday, and when we return from maintenance, we'll be in the new allocation year. Um, Helen, I know you've done a, a lot of the uh, preparation and planning for this. Would you like to talk a little about the allocation year plans? Oh, sure. So, yeah, as you mentioned last day of AY. Uh, okay, you, this oh. okay, yeah, there is. So we're gonna cover uh, one of the main changes for this year are the uh, premium QoS. So this, <clears throat> so for, for premium, um, it's normally not, not used for your regular uh, computing at NERSC. It's for an uh, emergency, it's, um, not for like when you try to use up all your allocation, it's for emergency publication deadline experiment. <clears throat> so it should be used infrequently and so we have decided that we need to have a sort of threshold for our, the charging factor. So once you're over 20% uh, of the allocation high, high watermark, the premium will be charged double of its premium. So normally premium is two times of your regular uh, QoS charge charges. So when it's over 20% of the allocation, it'll be charged four times of a regular um, QoS charge. It, this this is temporary, and we may decide to change uh, depending on how this is usage. I will be um, observing this a new policy, and also a diff, a, a new um, <clears throat> setup is that we are not going to have premium being enabled by default for all the users. So PIs have to decide which users in their project can use uh, premium QoS. So during the year, this instruction, a link uh, on this page, during the year, uh, PIs can toggle um, a user's access to premium on and off. So next slide, please. This, <clears throat> then, then before um, the allocation year uh, starts, we are asking all the PIs to do two things. One is to, you have to decide which users will continue in the uh, project. So we, we're asking for uh, the PIs that are having current, currently um, allocation of AY 2020 allocation and their project is continued in AY 2021. So for those PIs, uh, we are asking you to decide which users you will uh, continue, allow, ask them to continue in your uh, next year's allocation. And also uh, with the same, um, choice you have to make this API, you are also to going to select which users you're allowing them to use premium QoS. Um, this, this instructions are, is already um, um, published, um, but the API for Iris is to do so will be um, available soon uh, um, by early next week when the uh, power maintenance is over. And then uh, we was <clears throat> Rebecca is going to send a separate email to all the PIs and PI processes to, to emphasize that PIs need to do this. Otherwise, uh, user's job in the queue may be deleted without users being continued or allowed to, to premium. So another um, recommendation is that the jobs in the queue right now is premium. And if you wanna avoid uh, surprising two time charge because uh, those jobs may start in AY21 instead of now, and and that you may think these jobs are not, you know, as the premium um, priority anymore. You can change it now to, to regular or make sure your uh, users are running um, 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 
having these jobs in the queue, they do have access to Chromium, but you still want them, those jobs to be run in the Chromium uh, QoS. Next slide, please. So on the day when AY21 starts, which is Wednesday, January 20th, we'll have iris down first, uh, then we'll have the new uh, allocation year data switch over. Then query does start at the same time, but then during this, um, when iris um, transition is over, query is going to, um, query slurm um, scheduler will have the access to the new uh, iris data. Then, then we'll uh, do some processing uh, the list of the jobs uh, list on this page are the jobs in the queue that we will uh, delete when after Corey comes back, those jobs will be gone. So, so those are the jobs that um, if, if the, the project is not continued for this year's allocation, all these jobs will be deleted. Or if a jobs, um, the allocation is, still, is continued, but PI didn't select this user to uh, continue in the next uh, like allocation year, those jobs will also have the invalid um, Slurm as association to be allowed to, to run jobs. So those jobs will be deleted. So PIs make sure to, um, to select you know, users that you, you did, um, desire to continue. And premium QoS as well, since they're not default anymore. If a, a user is not enabled for, for premium, those jobs will be deleted. Then Q, and the overrun QoS is for when allocation is out of hours. So obviously the start of the year, they were not um, out of hours, but the, the jobs uh, still in the overrun QoS will be deleted. And we also have a policy of uh, jobs held over 12 weeks. So we'll delete those jobs as well. Um, I'd want just to call out, um, normally we at allocation year, um, during the startup alloc new allocation year, we change our uh, software default. Uh, Intel compilers create PE software. This year, we decide to keep those the same as is. And we do have a um, potential to upgrade OS in the middle of the year, and we may uh, change a default at that time. I think that's all I have, Steve. Are you, do you have any questions? Anyone? Yes, uh, and while people are thinking of uh, any questions, um, so there's a link in the Zoom chat and also the webinars channel of the NERSC Slack to these slides, uh, which means that you can uh, yeah, click directly on the link to get to the web page. It saves a, a little bit of typing. But yeah, so we've got some. Yeah, so if you can go to the first page, Steve, uh, there's the link to the AY transition page. Uh -huh. yeah. Oops. yeah, this this link. This link is actually um, on the www.nurse.gov and for users. And if you go choose user announcement, and that's, that's that link is this uh, page is in the user announcement uh, menu. Then the instruction uh, of the API uh, yeah. is also part of this page. Cool, yep, yeah. so that's... Uh... That's very helpful. Thanks. Does anybody have any any questions or concerns they'd like to bring up about the allocation new tra transition? Probably most importantly is uh, check the jobs that you have on the, in the queue. Uh, if you're a PI or PI proxy, make sure that relevant users are enabled for premium. And if you're not, remind your PI to, you know, prepare for the uh, allocation new transition. Thanks, Helen. Um, so before we go on to a topic of the day, does anybody have any other announcements or comments they'd like to make? And if not, so our, our topic of today is the HPSS archival system at NERSC. And we have uh, Nick Balthazar from NERSC's uh, storage group to tell us a bit about HPSS. Um, Nick, I forgot to ask before, uh, would you like to share slides and control them from your computer or tell me next and I'll share them from here. 
Hi, Steve. Thanks. Uh, I can share slides from my laptop, and I'm going to apologize in advance for the barking dogs in the background. Uh, I am working from home this morning, so, you know, um, it is what it is. So I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. And uh, All right. I can start Let's my video too. Should, um, should be able to I don't have the regulation LBL background. I'm sorry. I'm on a, a, a MacBook <laughs> Air that doesn't support backgrounds, so you get to see my, um, my messy room. Um, <laughs> So hope everybody's okay with that. All right, here we go. Uh, can everybody see that okay? Uh, title uh, slide. That looks good. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks again for the op dogs. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak about HPSS. So. Uh, Steve contacted uh, Owen and myself, I think like last Friday night for uh, a quick presentation at NUG about HPSS with a suggested topic of the move out of our former Oakland uh, data center. So uh, um, Owen is frantically uh, powering stuff up at the data center as we speak. So that left me uh, kind of on the hook to give the talk, but that's okay. Uh, um, so this is about our, our move out of uh, the Oakland Scientific Facility that happened in uh, between, mostly between 2018 and 2019 and early 2020. Uh, I'll introduce the team really quickly. So uh, again, I'm Nick Balthazar. I'm an HPSS admin in the storage systems group. I deal mostly with day-to-day -day operations and before uh, shelter in place happened, I was uh, mostly on the hardware side and implementation. And uh, now I kind of do a little bit of everything. Wayne Hurlbert is our team lead. He's uh, responsible for what the system's going to look like in five years, as opposed to maybe this week or tomorrow. Um, Melinda Jacobson is an HPSS developer. She spends half of her time actually writing HPSS code and contributing it back to uh, the HPSS collaboration, which is uh, a collaboration between IBM and five uh, DOE labs, including NERSC. Um, and she spends the other half of her time uh, helping NERSC with software process improvements and our own uh, internal HPSS code and modifications. Owen James, who I mentioned, is uh, a member of the uh, OTG Operations Technology Group. He is our man in the field. He deals with a lot of the on-site day-to-day operations to keep HPSS running. And he's also responsible for knowing a lot of fun facts about HPSS, like you know how many MP3s could you hold in three tape libraries and stuff like that, which unfortunately I don't know. Uh, but he's always fun to talk to about uh, interesting HPSS and storage trivia. Christy Callback Rose is our group lead. Um, and she also uh, has a she also is on the HPSS technical committee, driving uh, future HPSS features. And finally, Kirill Lezinski uh, works half time on Lustre administration and half time on HPSS sort of DevOps type projects, and he's our uh, metadata specialist. So, usually when I give a presentation about NERSC, I have a few introductory slides about uh, what sort of work we do and how many users uh, we have and uh, their distribution across the world and the country. But since everybody here is a NERSC user, I, I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip that. But uh, I did want to mention uh, a bit about NERSC's uh, compute infrastructure and in particular the storage tiers. So uh, as you may know, uh, storage is arranged in tiers that uh, uh, form a hierarchy. The top of the hierarchy is typically uh, very fast storage that is uh, low capacity, and uh, the bottom tier of storage is uh, slower um, but higher capacity. And of course, uh, everybody wants the top tier to have uh, more capacity that's faster, and everybody wants the uh, lower tier to have uh, more speed and be easier to use. And uh, these tiers are arranged mostly uh, due to cost. Um, the higher tiers of storage just cost more. So, you know, we would put everything on flash if we could, but uh, that is cost prohibitive. So as you all know, the uh, compute platform is Cori, a Cray XC40 that's been in production for a number of years. 
The uh, top tier of our storage is the burst buffer, which is 1.8 petabytes of flash that uh, can stream data at a terabyte and a half per second. The uh, second tier storage is Corey's scratch file system, which is Luster on spinning disk. I believe it's a uh, Synexion hardware that is 30 petabytes and can move data at 700 gigs a second. The uh, third tier of storage is also a file system on spinning disk. It's uh, a GPFS file system called our community file system. It's running on IBM ESS hardware and can move data at uh, 100 gigs a second. And finally, uh, the last but not least, the uh, bottom tier of storage with uh, the least convenience but most capacity is the archive system that I work on, which is 230 petabytes of tape uh, in three IBM TS4500 libraries. And we can do a, uh, an aggregate uh, transfer of between 30 and 100 gigs a second, but uh, single transfers are typically between one and two gigs a second between HPSS and uh, the file system. So the archive is 43 years of uh, scientific data stored by uh, NERSC users in the scientific community. We have about 15,000 tape cartridges in three IBM TS4500 libraries. And in some cases, NERSC archive is the only copy of this data. We have been running uh, the HPSS software product, which as I mentioned, is a, uh, a collaborative product between IBM and uh, five DOE labs. Uh, we've been running that since 1998. We have two HPSS systems in production. The user facing system is called archive. Uh, we have 200 petabytes of tape, and that is where NERSC users store their, uh, their results, raw data, et cetera. We have a smaller system that is NERSC internal mostly for center backups, which is called Regent, and it has about 30 petabytes of tape. All of our data transfers so far are via client interface, HSI, HTAR, PFTP, and Globus. We don't have any direct file system interface yet, but that is a topic that we're looking at and actively exploring. So uh, for instance, GHI, GPFS, HPSS integration, there's a project uh, right now that's looking at that. And we're looking at other interfaces as, as well, such as the H HPSS fuse interface, which is kind of like NFS. Historically, we've grown uh, the archive at 1.4 uh, times per year. So this is a growth chart. When I joined the group in 2007, we had, I think, a petabyte, and now we have 230 petabytes. So it, it just keeps growing. Archive is in orange, and this is a stack chart. The region uh, doesn't actually have uh, 230 petabytes. It's actually only 30 petabytes uh, represented in green. So uh, the topic of the day is moving out of OSF. Uh, which we did uh, uh, between 2018 and actually early 2020. So in 2015, uh, NERSC, meaning the compute systems and ancillary systems, moved out of OSF to the current data center in Berkeley at CRT. Uh, it's a, a lead gold rated data center that uh, uses outside air for tooling. And for a variety of reasons, the tape archive remained in Oakland um, there's an article about uh, the move in inside HPC uh, with the link there that you can see in the slides. Uh, one of the principal reasons the archive stayed behind was we needed a solution um, for where to locate the tape. Uh, since CRT operates on uh, open air cooling, it relies on ambient weather conditions and temperature and humidity fluctuations uh, are bad for tape storage tape media reliability decreases with rapid, rapid temperature and humidity fluctuations. So we had a, a multiple year evaluation of uh, where to put the tape. I should also mention, which isn't in the slide, that uh, Oracle, our principal um, tape and drive vendor at the time, decided to stop supporting Oracle uh, Enterprise Media, which is uh, high performance, high speed tape media that we use for the archive. So we were also stuck for a decision as to uh, what technology to move the archive to uh, because our principal vendor of, of drives and media decided to uh, end of life their enterprise product. So this is just to show that, you know, th this is the uh, 
operating range for a tape system. And basically what this shows is that 90 degrees Fahrenheit is pretty much the limit in, in it's the blue area where uh, tape can operate safely. So 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 50, about 50% relative humidity is um, where we want tape to be and we don't want any rapid fluctuations. It's supposed to be a very consistent environment. So the, um, the Berkeley Data Center just uh, could get too hot or too humid or fluctuate um, too rapidly to be safe for tape. Another issue that uh, we've been encountering since 2017 is airborne particulate. Uh, tape does not like uh, dirty air. Uh, you know, it's it's a media that's basically air emitter mylar that, um, and it has a tape head just like an old cassette deck. And if it's if there's dirt in the air, that can interfere with reading and writing the media. And uh, every year during fire season, the air quality in the Bay Area has uh, gotten really bad. So uh, that's another issue for running tape that uh, that we've been having. And it's, uh, it's an issue in the CRT data center because of the open air cooling environment and um, sort of lack of filtration that the data center has. So we considered a lot of alternatives in moving the data center. This was a multi-year uh, process, like I said. We looked at hosting it in a commercial data center, which was costly and uh, remote management of it um, at the time seemed uh, difficult, although we're doing a lot of remote management now that we didn't expect to be doing. Uh, putting all the data in the cloud uh, comes up from time to time, but uh, users want the data faster than a cloud provider SLA. And, and uh, in our own analysis, it cost more than running the archive on premises. We looked at building out a room uh, in CRT, but uh, you know that was both costly and would uh, constrain data center space for other systems like the uh, the upcoming Perlmutter system, and we didn't want to do that. We looked at putting all the data in the file system, which again has cost uh, impacts and increased power consumption issues. And finally, uh, IBM came out with a hardware solution uh, for running tape in. Uh, uh, Sort of a rapidly fluctuating, a rapidly fluctuating environment called a uh, library with integrated cooling, and that was a cost-effective solution that solved two of our problems: one, the uh, ambient temperature fluctuation in CRT, and two, IBM is uh, an enterprise drive and media uh, vendor, so we could use their drives and, and media, and switch off of the old Oracle uh, media. So that was at least two of the three problems were solved with that solution. So here's a look at the uh, in a, one of the integrated cooling libraries that we have at CRT. Uh, this is a frame-based library. It's 16 frames of basically media and drives. And those boxes on top are uh, basically air conditioners that recirculate air inside a, a semi-sealed library and uh, keep the temperature and humidity fairly constant so that the data center can fluctuate, but uh, the environment inside the library remains consistent. Uh, as I said, these support enterprise uh, drives and media, so that solved our, our, uh, our enterprise media issue. We bought three of them. Uh, they're 16 frames each, 13,000 slots, and at least two of the three have 64 tape drives each running IBM JD Media at 15 terabytes of cartridge. Airborne particulate is still an issue for us. We're looking for a solution for that, but um, Nothing is, has come up yet. So uh, a quick look at the process of, of the move. Um, there were, uh, you know, this is obviously kind of a condensed uh, view of it. There were an awful lot of steps and it took a long time. But uh, one of the issues is that the IBM media is incompatible with the Oracle media. So we couldn't just load it up all on a truck and transfer it from Oakland to, to Berkeley. Uh, what we did was uh, run some I.O. movers in the Berkeley data center and cut file ingest over to the new libraries so that the Oracle complex became read only. And uh, what little IBM compatible media we did have in the archive system, we did actually move by truck. We had uh, 3000 cartridges that were packed up by OTG, mostly Owen and some interns and moved uh, every day for two weeks by courier um, in small batches of, uh, 
a few hundred cartridges. And uh, over the course of two weeks, uh, we moved all 3,000 cartridges. And this was mostly done to reduce user impact. So the chances that a read request would come from any cartridge in flight between Oakland and Berkeley uh, was minimized. And we did get a few requests and that kind of jammed things up. But uh, for the most part, that was pretty much transparent to users. We took one actual downtime to move the system. It was a nine hour downtime where we had to move the metadata servers and disk arrays. Uh, so, you know, those were physically unracked, uh, moved by truck and then re-racked at CRT and re-cabled over the course of nine hours. We brought HPSS down and then brought it back up uh, at CRT. Then there was uh, an ongoing data copy out of the Oracle libraries for almost a year where we uh, copied out 120 petabytes of data over a 400 gig dedicated link between Oakland and Berkeley. And uh, some days we, we exceeded half a petabyte a day. So that, uh, that worked very well. And uh, with the exception of a couple of damaged cartridges, it all made it to, uh, to Berkeley without a hitch and uh, with almost no downtime. This is a, a visualization of the data copy operation that uh, our team lead Wayne did. Um, I know the numbers are probably way too small to read on Zoom, but uh, basically you can see that um, on some of our peak days, uh, we sustained about uh, half a petabyte a day uh, for the large files, which stream better than small files. Um, and, and that went on for quite a while. We were also dealing with regular user ingest, which is between 150 and 300 terabytes a day. So we had some days where the TS4500 complex in Berkeley was taking in three quarters of a petabyte a day. And uh, we were able to sustain that. The smaller system uh, was a lot easier to move and we just did a forklift move. Um, we packed up all the cartridges into you know, hundreds of boxes, moved them all by truck and shut the system down and uh, moved it in one single 14 hour downtime. So again, Owen and his team were, uh, were critical in packing up the media and, you know, ejecting tapes, packing them up early in the morning and late at night and uh, arranging for all the media movement. So finally, after all the, uh, after all the equipment was moved out, we had to decommission all of the old stuff that was left. And that was a several month effort of unracking and uncabling stuff, uh, finding a salvage vendor to buy it, uh, throwing away what couldn't be bought and um, you know, finally moving all the equipment out of there. So uh, Wayne led that effort and it, was, uh, it, it took a good couple of months to get all of uh, the old, old stuff out of there. Uh, and I believe uh, the Oakland Scientific Facility is now uh, like a hole in the ground. I don't even, I think it's been demolished, but Glenn can probably uh, speak to that uh, since I think he has a view of it from his, his window. So that's all I have about HPSS. Uh, happy to take questions if uh, anybody has any. Oh, oh, can I ask a question? That was really interesting. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, uh, this is Koichi from Vienna now. Um, thank you for very interesting uh, presentation. I really um, love to know those behind the scene uh, efforts going on NASC. And uh, it's, yeah, it's really a lot of work. I can see that. Um, just a quick question, uh, because you mentioned the uh, current system has this, you know, is equipped with kind of air conditioning so that uh, keeps the tape in a good condition. But I'm just wondering what's going on right now because there's no power at the facility this week, right? So does that mean also HPSS archives temperature is fluctuating um, more in this week? Uh, thank you for the question. That's, that's a good question. Um, so, the, the tape libraries are, are down, so they're, they're unpowered. And so you're right, there's no uh, air conditioning going on. But the main issue uh, that we have is when IO is being done to tape. So um, as long as there are no reads or writes being done to the tape system, it should be fairly safe uh, if the temperature fluctuates, as long as it stays within that um, 
I showed you that chart, the psychromet psychrometric chart with the, uh, the blue area. As long as the overall uh, temperature remains there, as long as we're not doing IO to the tape system, it should be okay. And we will probably have the libraries powered up for a few hours before we start the system to let the uh, temperature inside the libraries uh, uh, become optimal. Uh, thanks for the question. That, that, was, that was good. Thank you. So, so you th there was a couple of things in your slides there and that you talked about that, that jumped out at me. Um, so one was you talked about the size of the data on HPSS increasing by 1.4 times per year, which sort of just sounds like a number. But then I noticed in that Inside HPC article that was published February 2019, and it said 120 petabytes of data. And so a little less than two years later, we're up at 230 petabytes, nearly twice as much. That's another you know, 110 petabytes of data in the last two years. That's a lot of data. Um. <laughs> it's a lot of data. I, I, it's an average over many years. So we, we do have fluctuations. Actually, um, in spite of what, what the numbers um, in spite of what the numbers say in Inside HPC, uh, I believe Wayne has observed that our ingest rate is down a little bit over the last couple of years. So maybe the last few years have been 1.3 or 1.2. But yeah, we, um, we handle a lot of data. Interesting. What, what kind of, with, with this growth rate, how frequently are we going to need to you know, add new tape systems? I, I guess it's sort of offset by the tapes getting higher capacity over time. Uh, thanks for the question. That, that's a good one as well. So like disk drive technology, tapes are always increasing in capacity as well. And uh, we have a constant effort going on to upgrade the tape, tape drives and media to meet the capacity demand while keeping the floor space con constraints uh, basically consistent. So right now we're uh, running 15 terabyte cartridges uh, and I believe at CRT sitting in pallets right now are the next generation of tape drives, which will run 20 terabyte cartridges. And uh, Wayne and I will go ahead and implement the new drive technology and then copy all of the 15 terabyte media onto the 20 terabyte media. And that's just a constant thing that happens with HPSS. Uh, every couple of years, we, we change the, uh, the underlying media technology. So that's, that's the magic of how that works. Uh, thank you for the question. So, and, and a question offline that I've been asked by users a couple of times is how frequently is data removed, like purged from HPSS? And I think you kind of covered the answer in, in one of your slides there when you talked about having data from 1970, was it? 74, I believe. 74? Is the, the oldest data in the archive. Yeah. Um, Sadly, I, I, I'm older than that. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, so we, we to date have never had to purge anything. Um, so users uh, have a quota and it's kind of a soft quota. And if they need more, we usually give it to them. And uh, yeah, we've never deleted anything. Um, and we kind of rely on users to clean up and be uh, good citizens. Cool, thanks. And, and so the one other thing that um, jumped out at me while you were talking was when you were describing the uh, sneaker net and moving, moving cartridges by truck. So a quick back of the envelope calculation suggests that the truck had a, a bandwidth of about 600 gigabytes per second. <laughs> That's another one of those fun facts that Owen figured out actually. He did figure out how much bandwidth a FedEx truck has. And I, I, uh, I can't remember the number, but I think it was, it was much greater than than the actual bandwidth of HPSS uh, over the network. Mm. There's a, a, I saw an old quote once, never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes. And, uh, yeah. That's right. No, that's, that's, that's actually very true. Um, it, it moved data faster than, than we can over the network. Um, uh, I, that may be embarrassing, but I mean, you can just pile a huge number of tapes into a truck. So. Even even the network, like the 400 gigabit link that was um, basically a special purpose network that was yeah, uncommonly fast, 
at its time, right? Yeah, not not many sites have a point to point four hundred gigabit link. That that is quite fast. Um, we have hundred gigabit moving to the HPSS movers, and they're uh, they're dual connected, so a, a single I/O mover can push maybe two hundred gigs a second, or gigabits a second. That's uh, you know divided by eight for gigabytes. But um, yeah, we. Spinning up multiple tape drives, uh, each tape drive can do maybe 300 or 350 megs a second. And I think we had 30 or 40 running continuously 24 seven to push that much data through the network. And we did saturate it. It's a huge data move. Yeah, thanks again, Nick. Um, does anybody else have any questions or, or comments they'd like to make? I even have a few more questions. I, I really like this uh, presentations, but I'm just wait for other people if they have uh, questions or comments. Maybe I can go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, which questions to first? Um, yeah. <laughs> So from your presentation, uh, I, you mentioned this, uh, the old system from Oracle and the new system from IBM were not compatible or consistent. And then I just didn't get how you guys solved the problem. Did you guys have to copy from Oracle to one something and then copy again? Or did you guys do anything more sophisticated? That's essentially the gist of it. Thank, thanks, that's another really good question. Um, so that's right, the Oracle media and tape drive technology uh, is not compatible with IBM. They won't read each other's media or cartridges. So what we did was what you might do in any file system if you were you know, maybe copying from your Mac desktop to a Windows machine or something, we just kind of copied the files over the network, um, you know, read them out of the Oracle infrastructure over the network to the IBM infrastructure and just rewrote them onto the, uh, the IBM tapes. Uh, and, you know, the metadata is all handled by HPSS. So the files, the bits, all of that stuff uh, end up intact in, in the metadata database. And yeah, it was basically just a big, big copy or an R-sync if you, you want to think of it that way. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I, thanks for the I question. I have two more questions, actually. Sure. I can ask. Uh, the second question is about it's kind of related follow up, but uh, uh, security of this HPS system. I mean, security both in terms of any potential data loss or I don't know some confusion between metadata and actual data, and then also I don't know if any outside hackers attack HPSS system just to. I don't know, for, for my field, my climate science data, no, nothing is really sensitive, but maybe some more uh, different, you know, space physics or some other P national security have maybe sensitive data. And then some hackers may just want to give trouble to other people. So uh, they might do try to get access to storage. So yeah, just, just accidental, you know, erase or loss of data security and the more intentional attack kind of security. Uh, is there any, do you have to do something as, against those um, issues to maintain HPSS? Oh, those, those are also very good questions. So one is sort of a, a data integrity. How do we protect the metadata? Uh, and the other is more about a cybersecurity. Uh, how do we protect HPSS against cybersecurity attacks? Right. Uh, okay, so as far as the metadata goes, uh, we back it up every day. Um, and we use, you know, we, we use disk arrays that are, are, you know, RAID 6 plus 2, so we can lose disks. Um, and we have metadata backups. But to your point, if, you know, if an asteroid were, come, were to come and like wipe out CRT off the face of the map, that would be it for HPSS. We don't have, um, Offsite copies of the data. Uh, we do have offsite copies of the metadata, but of course, if your data is gone, the metadata doesn't do much good. Um, 
so we do what we can to to make sure the metadata uh, is protected and backed up um, and not corrupt and all of that stuff. Um, Wait. And we do have offsite copies of that, but not offsite copies of the data. Mm -hmm. As far as the cybersecurity question, um, we're prone to you know, stolen credentials just like any other system. So if somebody say, it's difficult to steal your credential these days because we're using uh, one-time passwords. So we're a little bit uh, more protected at NERSC than we used to be. But if someone, someone were able to steal your login, they would have access to your HPS test credential and they could, you know, assuming they knew how to use HSI, which seems to be a hurdle for many of our users, um, they could get go in there and mess things up. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't, we don't have backup copies of the data. So it, it is a risk that, you know, if somebody were to steal your credential and hack into Corey or something, you know, they could potentially delete your data. Um, do, do you think they can delete the data even, even if somebody steal my, uh, you know, uh, identity and then log in HPSS, do you think they can find a way to delete the data that they do not, I don't have access, read, write, uh, access? I don't think so. That's it's standard Unix. So HPSS sort of implements a POSIX type file system on tape. So it's standard Unix permissions. And unless they were able to somehow steal, you know, the HPSS root credential, mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't be able to read other users' files if they still say, you know, my identity or your, your identity. But I, I think the identity theft um, risk is a lot lower these days with, with one-time passwords. And of course, you know, if we do find out about a breach, we can, re we can revoke somebody's HPSS token. Um, but yeah, if somebody were to go in there and erase all your data, uh, we couldn't get it back. So we do advise you, you know, if there's something that is super critical for multiple reasons, both, you know, because the center is prone to disasters like anywhere else, and because we don't have uh, another redundant center, center online, if you have something that is really super important, a, a second copy of it offsite is probably a good idea. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. I, I'll pass that to my uh, project managers, I think. Um, to, yeah. to be fair, we, um, we have a, a pretty good reputation uh, in our HPSS system of, of being uh, reliable and uh, you know, the data integrity uh, has a, uh, we have a good record. So not to say nothing could happen, but um, we are super careful. Thank you. Um, Thanks for the questions. Can I ask one more, maybe <laughs> quick question? <laughs> Sorry. How are we doing on time, about, Steve? I, two, I, I don't mind. We've got about two minutes left. We, we've got uh, one more kind of slide after this of a few tips for HPSS um, for, well, maybe, for like usage uh, maybe tips. I Maybe I can post on the on the Slack or somewhere, uh, Christian. Maybe. Uh, sure, you can contact Steve, and he, you know, we can exchange email addresses, or, um, you know, yeah, I, I'm happy to answer can, questions offline. We can as well. continue the discussion in the webinars channel on Slack as well. Okay. okay. Or perhaps uh, go through the the schedule parts of this meeting, and then those who are interested and and still available after twelve can continue talking. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, thank you. I can hang out for a few minutes after the meeting. That's fine. Oh, uh, so anyway, thank you again, Steve, for the opportunity to uh, give a little good press to HPSS. Cool. And thanks, Nick. That was a, a really interesting um, sort of talk and topic. Thank you. So uh, I'll reshare my screen. And so while we're on the HPSS topic, um, we have a, a couple of um, sort of user-facing tips here, a lot of them which are um, on our docs page at this address. Um, I think there's a couple of people from DAS, Lisa and Albert at least, uh, online. Do you want to say anything to uh, users about tips for using HPSS? Um, I think the main thing that I would emphasize to users is to remember what Nick pointed out is that at its heart, it's a tape system. Um, there's a disk archive that's at the top that makes it respond like a file system, but 
underneath its tapes. Um, and so that makes things, doing things like um, putting 100,000 small files into it um, that would normally be kind of okay on a file system, although 100,000 is not always great on a file system. Anyway, um, it'd be kind of okay on a file system, but it's not great on a tape system because they end up spread all over the place. And I think that is right now the most common um, issue that users run into. Um, when you're storing files into HPSS, you really need to bundle them. <clears throat> and you need to kind of aim for, if you have lots of small files, you want to bundle them together either with HTAR or with just a regular TAR. Um, and the sort of optimal size is anywhere between 100 gigabytes and two terabytes. And so we'd really encourage users to, to think about how you would be getting the data back out if you do need it and to bundle them up accordingly. Cool, thanks Lisa. And yeah, if, uh, if you are having trouble using it or working out how to use it or best practices, um, the docs are hopefully helpful, but you know, also drop us a line via help at nurse.gov. So in the last couple of minutes uh, coming up, we're always interested in topic requests and suggestions. Um, maybe we'll uh, keep that one on the, on the Slack channel. And just to finish up a quick run over last month's numbers, so Corey's availability was uh, yeah, quite high, 98.7%. Um, scheduled a little lower when you uh, include the maintenance, scheduled maintenance in there. Uh, normally I have a, you know, a, a little graphic here kind of showing a timeline of when and for how long the various um, yeah, outages and so on were, but my script for doing that is on Corey, which is currently unavailable. So it's just a, a little bit of text here. Um, we had uh, very high utilization in, uh, that's a typo, that should be November, um, of over 95%, and almost half of them were large jobs using more than a thousand nodes. So that was uh, good to see that, it's, that Corey is being used for, yeah, for large scale uh, challenging science that really needs these sort of systems. And that brings us to the top of the hour. Thank you all for participating. Um, it sounds like Nick might have a, a few minutes before uh, needing to run off to the next thing. So, um, so we can continue sort of chatting briefly about HPSS. Um, I forgot to mention we're recording this. Uh, so you will be able to you know, see the presentation again. Uh, we'll post a, a link to that and um, post the recording on the on the web page afterwards. Thanks again all. Thank um, you so much. Pochi, what was what was the, the other question actually, you had? Actually, if you go back to the slide for the HPSS, I just wanted to know, uh, remind it more detail about how to use Globus to HPSS. I got a question oh, from, uh, um, one more, yeah, here. Uh, for you know, Globus warning of file systems not allow append. I think I asked this question before here, but I also asked by one of the members in my division or project. Uh, so I recommended them, you know, oh, maybe we should do the two step, you know, first. So they are trying to move a lot of data from PNL computing to the NASC HPSS, but uh, I advise them to do the two step first to scratch and then to HPSS, but they simply ask why. And I couldn't answer. I, I remember we briefly discussed, but I didn't totally understand the underlying, underlying reason. So um, just wanted to know some details about why, uh, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, we get this uh, message and then slows down when we directly move from somewhere else to directly HPSS through Globus. Uh, so, so I, quick question. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yep. No, no, go. Uh, I was just going to uh, handball, was, but somebody else has deeper knowledge of this than me. <laughs> uh, well, not necessarily. But um, was the transfer out of NERSC HPSS or was it storing data to NERSC HPSS? Storing data to NERSC HPSS. So using Globus to move data from outside to NERSC HPSS. Okay. Um, and was it from one HPSS system to another? And that was the, uh, the issue and they, uh, on the 
the other side they wanted you to uh, move it to a file system first? Uh, no, the other part is not necessarily uh, HPSS archive system. The other external source one time was just a scratch space on that side. And okay. then moving them to uh, HPSS. Uh, so I believe, and, and Lisa can um, probably you know, clarify this, uh, that it's to do with Globus splitting the data stream into multiple fragments and doing them all at once. That's part of the reason. Um, for wide area network transfers, yes, Globus is only single stream. So the only way to, um, oh. the only way to move data effectively from uh, external file system to HPSS is to fire up multiple jobs you know, to uh, move data concurrently because on the HPSS side, it's only a serial um, protocol. Uh, it's an enhancement is coming, but it's going to be a while. Um, another issue that I can think of is um, Globus isn't really very smart about HPSS. Uh, so HPSS likes a few very large files instead of, you know, lots of small files. And that has to do with the tape backend that Lisa was talking about because it's a linear media and not random access like disk. So we prefer people to tar up their files on the remote side and then send us, you know, large tar files as opposed to just sort of, um, do an rsync like thing that Globus allows you to do where it just, you know, drag and drop a whole directory full of files. So that that's another issue we've seen with Globus is uh, sort of deluging the, uh, the, arc, the tape archive with lots of small files, which is both uh, kind of inefficient on the tape side and it also uh, metadata in the archive is kind of a bottleneck. So if we have a, a lot of small file movement on tape and a lot of small file IO in the metadata, it, it can really slow things down. Uh, I hope that answers the yeah. question somewhat. Yes, I think so. Uh, you said that particularly um, Globus is taking advantage of dividing data into chunks and then send in as multiple, I mean, um, paths, but uh, HPSS is, is basically single stream. So single stream for Globus. We do uh, multi-stream trans. Okay. Yeah, we do multi-stream transfers, parallel transfers with HSI and PFTP. But for Globus, mm. we're limited to a single stream grid FTP protocol. Oh, so okay. um, over a wide area network, that doesn't kill you too much. But um, you know, mm. small file I/O will. So we want to just make sure that users uh, bundle up their files before they send them to us with Globus. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I think that, Thanks for the question. That's, yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Um, cool. I guess I will, I will sign off. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity to, uh, to plug HPSS. Thanks again for the um, talk and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and we're at the end of the year as well. So, Happy holidays. <laughs>